Welcome to the Advanced Persistent Security Podcast, where we discuss the world of IT and cybersecurity. Don't be left in the dark about what is going on in the world around you. Here is your host, Joe Gray. Welcome to This Week in Security. We will kick this off discussing how cyber attacks have plagued the U.S. Department of Energy. Keep in mind, this includes nuclear power, fossil fuels, wind, solar, anything that falls under the United States Department of Energy. Long story short, with it, based on a Freedom of Information Act request, it was divulged that there have been over 150 successful cyber attacks with full root level access, meaning 100% access to the systems from 2010 to 2014. There were almost 1,200 attempts but only 150 successful, slightly greater than 10%. Either way, for adversaries, it could be a method to springboard into interconnected systems, duplicate what the United States is doing in regards to energy production, and lo and behold, the absolute worst case scenario based upon, I mean, what happened with Iran and Stuxnet, a terrorist could use for worst case scenarios out of any dystopian book or movie It could be an opportunity for a security researcher to, quote-unquote, get their name on the map or get their wrist in handcuffs. Either way, there was a notable attack in 2013 when about 100,000 employees and contractors was compromised. There were unclear lines of responsibility, lack of awareness by officials, and basically there were 41 servers and 14 workstations with easy or default passwords. It is believed that the attacks are coming from Russia, China, and Iran. They've all been probing the U.S. power grid for several years, mapping it out to find vulnerabilities. It comes at a vital time. It was released at the end of a four-day summit between U.S. and China, ahead of China's president coming to visit the United States president, Barack Obama. At the surface, it kind of seems impossible to defend the networks against these attacks. It is more difficult than most vectors, but it's not impossible. Basically, the Department of Energy and federal government need to be more stringent in their selection of hardware and software and the means they use for networking. They could use encrypted tunnels such as VPNs over commercial ISPs. That's kind of what they're doing now, but it may be better to use dedicated circuits with no outside connectivity. And I think more emphasis needs to be put on the background checks for the clearances because they determined that there were a couple of contractors suspected of espionage that are believed to be employees of the government of China. I am an advocate of open source software, open source technologies, everything that Advanced Persistent Security is building for the security products division is based on open source software. But there comes a certain time when it is not plausible to use something that is commercially available that someone can sit and put in a laboratory environment and probe for vulnerabilities knowing that if they can exploit it in their lab, they can go and do the same in the wild. And in this case, the wild being the United States Department of Energy. Another thing is social engineering. A lot of employees like to overshare. They like to over-embellish tout their titles, tout their accomplishments. LinkedIn is a double-edged sword in that case. You can use LinkedIn to get another job, to show you have an impressive background and get someone to be interested that may not normally be interested. But it is also a prime vector for social engineering, phishing, any sort of attack of that sort. For example, in 2012, there was a period that I was unemployed. So I changed my LinkedIn to match what my resume said in terms of my name. I don't ever go by my first name. Fast forward to late 2013, 2014, I had taken the job that I have in Atlanta as the director of IT security. And once I updated that with the information, it got to the point to where I was getting 30, 40 cold calls per day through the front desk asking for me by name, all because I had too much information on my LinkedIn. I eventually got to the point to where I asked callers where they got my information from and they said that it was from a lead source and I was able to actually socially engineer the information out of one to tell me that where those leads came from 
And with a little research, I determined that they were actually doing what I call scraping of LinkedIn, getting information in terms of names and companies and people that should have influence. So then I changed the company I work for from the actual title to an acronym that makes it a lot harder for them to put two and two together and contact me. Nonetheless, off of that, we're going to break down the meetings between the U.S. and China as well. So senior U.S. and Chinese officials met to discuss cybersecurity. It is no secret that the U.S. and China have a problem with each other in terms of cybersecurity. China claims that U.S. Cyber Command is attacking them, and then Mandian and other organizations are saying that APT-1, their Advanced Persistent Threat Unit, and Deep Panda, another unit alongside APT-1, are attacking the federal government, such as OPM. The leaders of the U.S., FBI, Homeland Security, Intelligence Community, Treasury, State, Justice Department, they all discussed it with Chinese leaders. And basically, it boils down to the OPM hacks and basically the loss of over 20 million American people's security clearance files. At the end of the summit, President Obama warned that cyber attacks from China were not acceptable. The U.S. is working on a few laws, such as the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015, also known as CISA, not to be confused with Certified Information Systems Auditor. But... The attacks uh, on the Department of Energy may help reignite the debate surrounding this act, which is stalled out in the Senate. There should be something done with the federal government. The, the NISC risk management framework is not perfect, but is better, at least with the defense perspective, than die cap or dits cap. As long as a culture of security, proper theory to practice, and continuous monitoring is enforced, it should be a step in the right direction. The problem that we have now is everything is based on compliance management. Everyone in the federal government knows what regulatory compliance they are subject to, and based upon that, instead of working to be more secure, they work to meet the requirements and nothing else. If it were, if it were possible to basically just continue to add requirements all the time, which would not be plausible, but it would actually make compliance management go away. Sit tight. We're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back to discuss the cyber attack on Excellus Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Are you looking for a place to advertise to the unique audience of IT security professionals and enthusiasts? Look no further. Advanced Persistent Security is seeking sponsors. This slot could be yours. Contact sales at advancedpersistentsecurity.net for more information. Thank you for sticking around during the break. Now we're going to talk about Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield. It was determined that they had a cyber attack that initially occurred on December 23rd, 2013, but was not discovered until August 5th, 2015. Now they're working with the FBI to help determine the scope of the breach. That makes them look pretty bad if it were live for almost two years before they discovered it. Stories from both PC World and Computer Weekly report that hackers may have had access to customer records to include the full gamut of personally identifiable information, name, address, phone number, date of birth, social security number, member ID numbers, financial accounts, member claims information. Thus far, they've not determined that this could tie in with Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield and the Office of Personnel Management OPM attack. Semantic believes OPM and Anthem breached to be based upon the cyber espionage group of Chinese origin called Black Vine. could also be known as Deep Panda. Modern Healthcare is reporting that hackers may have gained access to up to 10 million personal records. That would be 7 million Excellus members and 3.5 million of its non-blue subsidiary lifetime healthcare companies. Right now, we really don't have a lot of information but we know that they're subject to HIPAA. They should probably investigate their IT, take the appropriate actions to strengthen the security of their systems. There will probably be a plethora of HIPAA auditors willing to help, forced to help, offering to help, all the above. And honestly, they should just take it. Right now, they're offering two free years of credit monitoring and identity theft protection services. This is a start but it's kind of like a Band-Aid on a broken arm. If they had have done the due diligence in the beginning, they wouldn't have to really worry about this issue. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. 
Sit tight. We are going to take another break, and when we come back, we will be discussing the Android lock screen buffer overflow vulnerability. Are you subscribed to this podcast? If not, please do so on iTunes and at advancedpersistencesecurity.net slash podcast. And we are back to discuss the Android lock screen buffer overflow vulnerability. This is applicable to Android Lollipop mobile operating systems that use a password to lock your phone. If you use a pattern or a pin, you are safe from this vulnerability. The nutshell of how it works is the attacker will add a ridiculously large number of characters to the emergency call window and then copy them into Android Clipboard. I believe the exact count of number of characters required is around 110. The hacker swipes open the camera from the locked phone, accesses the option menu, pastes the characters into the password prompt instead of returning an error message, they unlock. This is versions 5.0 through 5.1.1. It was discovered by a security analyst at University of Texas. They discovered it, I believe, in June. They turned it over to Google. Google got it fixed. Then they went live with it after it was fixed. The specific fix for it came out in build LY, I'm sorry, LMY48M due to the carrier's inability to get patches out to the device in a timely manner. Some devices are still vulnerable. You should take a look at it. It also seems to be only applicable on Nexus devices. Either way, take a look at it. See if you are susceptible to it and consider for the meantime using a pattern or a pin for your phone. In the future, hopefully carriers will develop a better method to get these updates rolled out in a timely manner to avoid this. But obviously the carriers aren't so much worried about it in terms of the security of the phone itself unless it's throttling a lot of data through. And at that point they would just shut it down. That's all we have on the Android Buffer Overflow lock screen vulnerability. Sit tight. We're going to take our final break, and then we will come back and discuss when Flash will stop being the hacker's exploit of choice. Don't forget to check out our blog at advancedpersistentsecurity.net slash blog. Follow us on Twitter at advpersistentsec. And follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash advanced persistent security. Thank you for sticking around. This is the final segment. We're going to talk about when Flash will stop being the exploit of choice. Flash has been something of controversy for security professionals due to its massive amount of known vulnerabilities for a long time. It has become a popular target for hackers and the list of vulnerabilities continues to grow. So when... Will there be a replacement? Microsoft has Silverlight, but what does Adobe have? A lot of companies have the goal of phasing Flash out. Facebook, Google, Mozilla, they've all been pushing to do away with Flash. It's still used through the internet, and it's a detriment to any company who allows it to be allowed on its network. It all depends on how the security professionals maintain it. It has been proven that running with reduced privileges can mitigate a majority of the vulnerabilities, but that's only part of them. That doesn't do anything for things like buffer overflow, privilege escalation, so forth and so on. Adobe can't keep up with the vulnerabilities because, well, the thing is, why should they maintain things for, say, Flash, Reader, Shockwave, or Air when they are all free, when their flagship is Photoshop? and the creative suite, which includes Flash Professional, Acrobat instead of Reader, and the entire plethora of software that really goes into the creative suite. The other problem that comes with this is that people who find the vulnerabilities aren't always reporting it. And it goes back to the problem we discussed with Kaspersky and FireEye. They are lucky that he put it publicly on Twitter. In, in both scenarios with different people. Not everyone is that nice. The final thoughts, at some point, Flash will either phase out or something drastic will come in place on Adobe's behalf and fix the problem. But until then, we just have to mitigate it and stay tuned. Thanks for stopping by. 
Come back again on Thursday. We kick off the first four controls of the SANS Top 20 to include inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices, inventory of authorized and unauthorized software, secure configurations for hardware and software on mobile devices, laptops, workstations, and servers, and continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the Advanced Persistent Security Podcast. Until next time, stay secure and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast.